Well, we're very glad to have Alan Knutson from Cornell University, who's going to tell us about resolutions of Richardson varieties, stable curves, and dual simplicial spheres. Thanks for having me. So uh, let's start with a standard thing when meets in, um, in smooth uh, algebraic geometry, uh, where one has a, let's say, compact complex manifold, and inside it, a bunch of co-dimension one submanifolds. So each one of them is smooth, but the union of them isn't smooth. So the basic picture you should have is CP2 and maybe three lines in CP2 forming a triangle, or maybe another line touching the, um, crossing the, them. Maybe you've got several lines just generically sitting in CP2. I don't want though, uh, three of them to intersect at a point. So what I want is specifically that wherever there is intersection, it should be a nice transverse complete intersection. That the intersection of, of my divisors, if, if I intersect K of my divisors, I want that to be smooth co-dimension K and I'd like it to be connected. So I'm not gonna be um, really, I, a picture that I wouldn't like would be a line and a conic in the plane uh, whose intersection would be two points. So uh, when you have all this set up, when you have these, uh, these divisors and they are normal crossings, that's the complete intersection thing, that intersection of K of them is the smooth, like I could have mentioned K, and the connectedness, that's the simple normal crossings, then we call it SNCD. And we call it SNCD so much that I will speak of an SNCD instead of a SNCD that will be, you know, I, I won't say, I, um, SNCD is uh, already a word for me. So there's this combinatorial setup you can associate to an SNCD where each divisor gets replaced by a point. So it's gonna be a dual situation where small things are big and big things are small. So each divisor, which are, uh, will be replaced by a point. And when K of my divisors intersect in something non-empty, then I will put in a K minus one dimensional simplex there to connect those points. So this is called the dual simplicial complex to the SNCD. And it turns out these can be arbitrarily bad. There's a construction of Kolar to, Construct any simplicial complex as a um, as the as the dual of some SNCD. So, what simplicial complex here? I mean, what a combinatorialist calls a simplicial complex, which is a bunch of vertices and a bunch of subsets that are closed under going down. Um, how do I mute my Discord? Um, fine. No, I'm not going to. Um, so, <clears throat> uh, if you, yeah, so if you take a general SNCD, then there's nothing much to be said about what this simplicial complex can look like. But I'm particularly going to be interested in this case where the, so where the SNCD is anti-canonical. So you should think of something like um, so on, on CPN, we know the canonical class is O of minus N minus one. And that negative tells you already, from my point of view, that the canonical was the weird thing to look at. We should be looking at the anti-canonical. But I guess that's just because I like projective space more than I like surfaces of general type or whatever that are the, you, that are the places where one really wants to use the canonical class. So the varieties I have in mind are much closer to being Fano and it's much more likely that the anti-canonical will be ample on them. So on CP2, the anti-canonical class is O of three. And so if I had a union of three lines on CP2, then that would be anti-canonical. And there's uh, another example of an anti-canonical uh, divisor, anti-canonical SNCD, is if you have a smooth toric variety. So this is gonna generalize the CP2 case. If you got the smooth toric variety associated to some nice polytope, then the complement of the generic torus orbit is anti-canonical. 
And in this case, in this anti-canonical situation, uh, Kolar and Shu uh, repeat this folk conjecture and they blame a few people for it, but they don't have a reference that the dual simplicial complex should be homotopic to a sphere of a finite group. And in particular, they prove things like it's a homology sphere that uh, um, uh, that it's got that topologically it's it's got this fairly um, fairly strong condition towards looking like a sphere. So I want to give a couple of examples today where these SNCDs arise naturally, and uh, so it, they're, the conjecture is homotopic. Um, and, but in what I'm going to say today, I'll be giving you examples that arise in nature where the dual spatial complex will in fact be homeomorphic to a sphere, no finite group necessary. So I'll be getting spheres on the nose homeomorphically in the examples that I, that I have coming. So uh, I've got a couple of yucky examples here of things that um, aren't uh, SNCDs. Uh, <clears throat> And but they're um, they're not too relevant. So here's a um, here's a SNCD. So let's take a sequence of simple reflections, and you can think simple reflections in type A. This is already an interesting thing to do in type A. What I'm doing right here, um, <clears throat> and I got to talk to uh, uh, Samuelson about it at Stanford um, uh, a long time ago when Samuelson was around. Uh, uh, what, uh, what the bot samuelson manifold is, and this is not how uh, they defined it, uh, because they were thinking uh, in, the, in the early 50s, uh, at the time, algebraic groups didn't exist. Uh, they did, were doing things with compact groups. But I'm going to take a bot samuelson uh, I'll just talk about something homeomorphic to what they were doing. It'll be a list of flags. And each of these flags will be almost equal to the previous flag. In type A, the difference will be that my, my i flag will be equal to my i minus first flag, except in one dimension. So I might, I might change the three plane, then I might change the one plane, then I might change the three plane again, then the four plane, then the three plane. So I'm going to start with the base flag here. That's f naught, this b mod b. And then I'm going to change my flags just a little bit. and each time there's going to be a P1's worth of possibilities. Because if you know your four plane and you know your six plane and you want to pick a five plane in between, it's like picking a point in P1, the six plane mod, the four plane. So each time I do this, each time I take a step forward in this list of flags, I've got a P1's worth of choices. And it depends on the previous one. So I'm not getting a big product of P1s. I'm getting an iterated bundle of P1s. But an iterated bundle of P1s is an easy thing to think about. It's Smooth. It's got these points with two to the n many fixed points. It's a uh, it's projective. Um, it's a uh, uh, it's a great variety, and uh, and I'm stating it here with a general group. But uh, but you can just think I've got this tuple of flags, each one of which is almost equal to the previous, <clears throat> and I get this iterated bundle of p ones. So the bot Samuelson map is. Oh, I'm sorry. Uh, where's the SNCD? So the SNCD is what if you take one of these flags and ask it to be equal to the previous flag? So you don't use your P1 worth of choices all the way. You uh, um, There's one step where you say, nah, I'll just keep my old flag. And that cuts you down one dimension and you get uh, length of Q, many different divisors there. And each of those divisors is obviously itself isomorphic to a bot samuelson manifold. It's, a, it's isomorphic to the bot samuelson where you left that letter out of your word for big Q. So, so you get a whole bunch of divisors, each of which is obviously smooth. If you intersect a bunch of them, then that's just saying I'm going to have F3 is equal to F2, and F6 is equal to F5 is equal to F4. You'll, you'll have a bunch of equalities. And obviously, you keep getting smaller and smaller bot samuelsons this way. So you get this very easy SNCD in the bot samuelson manifold with what I'm going to call sub bot samuelsons. And I say it's a boring SNCD because if I intersect 
any set of them, for example, if I say intersect all of them, I'm going to get something not empty. I intersect all of them and I get the first flag equals, or the zeroth flag equals the first flag equals the second flag, dot, dot, dot. I just get the base flag. I intersect all of them and I get a point. And that means that the associated special complex is a simplex. All right, so that's boring. Uh, I mean, homeomorphic to a ball is a nice thing to have, but um, not because you're just a simplex. So that's that's not going to be the SNCD I'm I'm really interested in. But uh, <clears throat> uh, I'm going to be using one more structure on the Vought Samuelson, which is this map it has to the flag manifold, where you say, I started the base flag and then I messed around for a long time and I finally got this last flag. Let's just think about the end point. Let's not worry about how we got here. Let's just take this very last flag. And that's a map to Gmod B. And so what sort of groups are acting here? So on Gmod B, we have G acting. And on each of these Gmod Bs, we have G acting. But this spoils the symmetry a bit right here. Asking the very zeroth flag be the base flag means that the only thing it acts on this guy is B, not G. So this will still be a B equivariant map. And that's pretty good because B only has finitely many orbits on G mod B. This guy is projective, so its image will be closed. This guy is irreducible, so its image will be irreducible. So it's got to be some irreducible B invariant closed subvariety of G mod B, and there's only finitely many of those. So it's going to be one of those B orbit closures. And that's there's some combinatorics going on here where a word in my generators of my vial group went in and a vial group element came out. And the obvious guess is, yeah, you multiply the generators together and you get the vial group element. And that's not right because, you know, as Q gets bigger, this image is going to get bigger. After a while, if G is finite dimensional, this image is going to be the whole thing. And then you keep adding stuff to Q and you're just going to keep getting the whole thing. So, what people use this for, this was not, so Bott and Samuelson, I'll just say since I'm at Stanford, what Bott and Samuelson cared about, which is they said, let's take Q to be a reduced word for the long element in, in W. So they took G finite dimensional um, and they took Q to be uh, a reduced word for that W naught. And in that case, they got that this map was, uh, birational. They didn't use that word because they were doing topology, not algebraic geometry. But anyway, this uh, was a degree one map. And uh, and this guy's cohomology is sort of much easier to think about because it's this iterated P1 bundle. So this, the, the theorem I'm telling you predates the Borel's computation of the cohomology ring of G mod B. So Bott, Samuel, Bott and Samuelson wanted to compute that, and they did. They beat Burrell to it, but they didn't get a presentation. What they say is there's a map from cohomology of G mod B into cohomology of the Bott Samuelson. It's an inclusion. It uh, <clears throat> uh, because of the degree one stuff. It gives you a subring of this guy's cohomology, and it's the subring that's the stuff generated in degree two. So they uh, they identify the cohomology ring of this with this kind of weirdly stated ring, sub ring of some other, of some other comprehensible ring. Anyway, that's what they cared about. But in particular, they were thinking that they, would that they really wanted to understand the flag manifold. So what these are typically used for since then, um, starting, um, <clears throat> uh, there is no U in Samuelson. Um, uh, what they were doing, uh, um, uh, was they were they were thinking about a map that went to on, onto all of G mod B, but typically starting in the 70s, people were using this where Q was shorter and it wouldn't hit all G mod B, it would hit one of these uh, these Schubert varieties, these B orbit closures. And then with uh, just a little bit of work, you can ensure that it'll be birational to that and give you a resolution of singularities of the Schubert variety. And it's not a small resolution, it's not a strict resolution. Um, in some ways, it's kind of bad for the point of view of people who think about resolutions of singularities. Um, it is a very combinatorially comprehensible resolution because, like I said, it's got this torus action with isolated fixed points, and you can just enumerate them. 
So, um, so it's got its good and bad uh, uh, qualities. All right, so I already complained about the um, SNCD here and how boring it is. Okay, so let's take this map from the bot samples into the flag manifold and let's insist that the last letter, sorry, the last um, flag in our, in our tuple, let's insist to be the biggest thing it can be. So if you wanna take the case where Q is so long that we managed to map onto G mod B, then I'm asking that the last element of my flag be the opposite uh, base flag. So instead of using coordinate one, then two, then three, it uses coordinate n, then n minus one, then n minus two, da, da, da. And, <clears throat> and this thing I'm gonna call the brick manifold because it's related to some stuff that uh, combinatorialists were doing before that um, they assigned, uh, that they um, assigned these polytopes to and called brick polytopes. And uh, these manifolds, um, are usually not toric varieties, but they have moment maps to those brick polytopes. So it's not the, the, the origin of the name brick isn't so important, but it is nice that there weren't brick manifolds before, so it is unique. Um, <clears throat> okay. Uh, so if you take this fiber, it is a general enough fiber of this, uh, of this map that it will be also smooth. So it's torus invariant, it's smooth, um, it's uh, you can intersect the SNCD on the, the boring SNCD we have on BSQ. You can intersect it with this fiber and you get an interesting SNCD in the brick manifold. And what uh, Laura Escobar uh, observed in her thesis is that the dual symposial complex to that is a subword complex, which is a kind of symposial complex <clears throat> that I defined with Ezra Miller uh, 11 years earlier. And uh, it's one of the really nice ones where the subword complex is homeomorphic to a sphere, not a ball. So subword complexes in general, what they're about is the input to make a subword complex <clears throat> is a pair of a word like Q and a value group element like W. And uh, the, the vertices of a subword complex, I'm telling you the definition, the vertices are Q itself and a collection of letters is allowed to form a face if its complement is a reduced word for W. That's the definition of subword complex. And we prove uh, that such things, so it's, it's I think a, a nine page paper. We prove that, um, that those are always homeomorphic to balls or spheres. There's an inductive way to prove such things. And in the case where the, where the image of the bot Samuelson for Q is just uh, X super W in that special case, then we get a sphere, not a, not a ball. Okay, so that's nice. I've got uh, an example. Um, uh, <clears throat> um, uh, so the inductive way is it is shellable, but it's better than shellable, it's vertex decomposable. So shellable is the statement that um, uh, that you can glue in the um, uh, um, uh, I, I do hope somebody's going to post a picture of the two Ezra Millers because uh, um, uh, I'm afraid that my Ezra Miller doesn't dress nearly as well as the uh, threatener. Um, so the shellability is about uh, having this emotional complex and saying, I want to make sure it's homeomorphic to a ball by gluing on the facets one by one and saying, yep, still a ball, yep, still a ball, yep, still a ball. So that's the, uh, uh, there's tons and tons of shellings when you have a, if you have one shelling, there's going to be lots more. And so it's kind of hard in that sense to write down a shelling because there's so many of them. How do you choose which way you're going to do it? Um, vertex decomposable is about finding a clever enumeration of the vertices instead of a clever enumeration of the facets. And so whenever you have any vertex in this proposal complex, you can say, let's consider the star of that vertex, which means things that touch the vertex, and the deletion, which means things that don't. And if you're lucky, um, the star and the deletion are each balls of dimension n, 
and the intersection is a ball of dimension n minus one on the boundary. And so I got this ball, union this ball, glued together along this ball, it's a ball. So in this case, the vertices come in this really stupid order because Q was a word and that order works. So that's why our paper is only nine pages, basically. Okay, so a, um, a Richardson variety is like a, um, <clears throat> uh, is like a Schubert variety. So remember I had these Schubert varieties, which are these B orbit closures on, mm -hmm. um, on G mod B. And since I need both of them, you know, I'd actually prefer to call this an opposite Schubert variety. So I'm gonna do that. This will be an opposite Schubert variety. If you take a B minus orbit closure, I'm gonna call that a Schubert variety. So I've got, um, I've got these Richardsons where I intersect this B minus orbit closure and this um, B orbit closure. And when you intersect those things, uh, they intersect transversely and you get this irreducible variety inside G mod B. I mean, you might get the empty set. So only if V is larger than U in Bruja order, will you get something not empty. And when V is larger than U, I like to put it on top. And that's why I prefer to have X super V be this guy and X sub U be that guy. So for people who like to draw their Hasse diagrams upside down, uh, maybe you'd want X U V here, but uh, I'm sticking with, uh, with this way to do things. So, we know how to resolve this guy, um, and we know how to resolve that guy. Uh, this one I said, let's use about Samuelson. And this one, you could just take about Samuelson and multiply it on the left by W naught so that it so that it maps in B minus equivariantly instead of B equivariantly. And Brion observes, well, these guys are transverse, so those maps are transverse. So take the fiber product of these two uh, of these two maps, and you end up with something that gives you a resolution of singularities of the Richardson. So if you think about it a little bit, you can figure out that, the, that such a thing is in fact a brick manifold. And um, I think I've been screwing around enough that I won't take time to do that, but uh, you can ask me about it. So, so th this is not a canonical, you're, you're saying this is not a canonical resolution? Are, are there a... I, gotta, I, I gotta be careful here with the word canonical. It's not a God-given resolution, okay? Because I used words, right? So if, if you fix U and V, and you want to resolve this guy, you're going to need to pick Q and R. Okay. And different Qs and Rs will get you different manifolds. Excellent. Great. Thanks. So, um, so it's not a God-given resolution. Um, what will be true is that, um, uh, and maybe it didn't say here, but what is true, oh no, uh, I, what, what I forgot to put on this slide is the fact that the SNCD in the brick manifold is anti-canonical. So, um, so I am taking the boundary of the Richardson by which, I, by which I mean the union of all smaller Richardsons and I'm doing a log resolution of that thing to an anti-canonical SNCD. Uh, was that the sort of thing you wanted, you were worried about or were you worried about the God-givenness? It was the God-givenness I was worried about. Okay, yep, nope. So uh, different Qs and Rs will get you different manifolds, different simple complexes. The only thing for sure is that they'll all get you spheres, the same dimension sphere. So that's the same. All right, so this was a case where we, where Ezra and I did the combinatorics. I mean, uh, too far, it would go too far afield to say how the geometry led us to the definition of subword complex, but there's no geometry in our subword complex paper, it's just, combinatorics and some uh, homological algebra. <clears throat> and, uh, but you can give the complete definition of subword complex like I did. Um, and um, the, let's see. Um, so the, we got to the combinatorics there first and uh, didn't really understand geometrically where subword complexes come from in general. We knew have this special case, which was the pipe dream complex that we did, but subword complexes in general, just the combinatorics wanted us to do that. And it wasn't really until Escobar's thesis that we had 
Well, there, there's a couple of different geometric ways to cut, to run into these, and um, uh, and one of them is uh, in in her thesis. Uh, anyway, it's an example of the folklore conjecture. Uh, so the question of could, can one use these canonical these God given resolutions uh, to do super calculus? Uh, sounds great to me, but I um, uh, uh, I haven't gotten uh, um, very far with it. We can talk more about it. So uh, here's an example of what these simplicial complexes look like. So uh, let's take the case that something like what Botten Samuelson wanted to do. So Botten Samuelson said, let's blow up the flag manifold gratuitously. It's already smooth, but let's blow it up so we end up with this simpler guy, the Bot Samuelson, whose cohomology we're better at computing. And now I'm going to blow it up, not just the Schuberts, I'm going to blow up the opposite Schuberts too. Um, and I'm going to do that, or vice versa. I'm going to blow up both the Schuberts and the opposite Schuberts so that I end up with um, a stratified space where the stratification is given by an SNCD instead of the stratification being given by the Schuberts and the opposite Schuberts which is not as nice as an SNCD. So I do that and I'll be using the brick manifold for this word. So it came from these two reduced words. I concatenate them together. I reverse one of them, even though you can't tell because it's a, a palindrome. And I end up with this guy. And then I'm thinking about subwords of that. Now, remember there was this complementation that takes some years to get straight when thinking about subword complexes, that a set of letters in, a, in Q is allowed to be a face if its complement is a sub um, uh, contains a reduced word for W. The facets come from complements, and the faces come from things whose complements contain reduced words. All right, sorry. Facets come from exactly reduced words. Take complement, and so so the facets here are these yellow guys, like this one, two, one, dash, 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 or this one, two, dash, 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 one. So the top dimensional things here, which is two dimensional, those you see the subwords of this guy that multiply out to W naught. So some of them are one, two, ones, some of them are two, one, twos. Um, <clears throat> and then you start intersecting those facets and you start getting down to um, lower dimensional faces. But because of the complementation, I'm going to be labeling them with the unions of the subwords. So this union, this union, this union, this is getting me this vertex. And you'll note if you if this dot 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 comes around the east side back uh, over the west, you'll note that I have a two sphere in this uh, in this picture, a two sphere that I've triangulated with. One, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight, nine. Um, uh, no, seven, eight, I guess. Um, many uh, triangles. All right, so there's the sphere. There's an example. Now, the rest of the talk um, is going to be new stuff. So as I say, this is, <clears throat> this is from 2016. Um, the rest of the talk is going to be the new stuff. Uh, well, here, um, which is about another resolution of Richardson's, uh, and it'll it'll again get us an anti-canonical SNCD. Um, what'll be a little bit different is that this anti-canonical SNCD will not live in a manifold; it'll live inside this um, uh, inside this Deline Mumford stack M zero n bar. So uh, I'll be more careful about what M zero n bar I'm talking about in a minute. So I'm nearly smooth. I don't know if there's a, um, a folklore conjecture about SNCDs inside, um, inside stacks, but apparently I'm getting an example of what uh, such a conjecture should be about. Okay, so uh, this is just background about M0 and bars that uh, probably everybody knows, but uh, let's, let's go through it. So I'm going to fix a homology class in M and that's because I'm going to be mapping P1 into M, and the and the fundamental class of P1 will get me some final, some some element in H lower two of M, and I want to fix that one. I say I'm only considering maps of P1, uh, these guys gamma maps of uh, <clears throat> of P1 or maybe something more complicated 
um, into M that induce that particular homology class beta. So um, you might say we're really interested in maps of P1 into M, and then we complain that that space isn't um, compact. How do we take limits? And there's this famous way to take limits where you allow your P1 to degenerate and it becomes a, a bunch of P1s glued together. Uh, and they'll, uh, I, because I eventually wanted to find some space that's connected, I'm not gonna allow all waves from the glue together. I'm gonna to insist that I get a tree. Um, <clears throat> I'm only gonna allow nodal crossings, not more complicated singularities. Uh, there's gonna be an, an extra um, bit of, uh, of uh, structure, which is I'll have n points on my on my p1 or more generally on my tree. So it'll be distributed around the tree, and then there'll be the stability condition that uh, the map should have only finitely many automorphisms. So if I'm embedding gamma into M, then it's like sticking an insect into amber. It's not it, it can't go anywhere. But if I had like a component of, uh, of gamma that mapped down to a point, then there would be, uh, sorry, not of gamma, of, of sigma, a component of sigma that mapped down to a point, then there'd be all these automorphisms it might have before it maps into M. So I say, no, it shouldn't have those. If you don't collapse to a point, then there should be enough anchors on <clears throat> that component that it has no automorphisms. So that's my condition, no, not mine. That's the standard condition for stability. And it's um, uh, and the nice thing is that you then get a compact moduli space, so, uh, a proper uh, stack. So um, that's what's, what you can find in, uh, um, in Fulton Pondre Pondre. Now, usually um, when you map into some, uh, some space M, uh, this uh, the stack is, uh, is quite complicated, but um, mapping into a flag manifold like I'm going to be doing in a moment uh, makes it much, much nicer. So there's some, the, the sort of thing that goes wrong with these is that the dimension isn't what you expect. And um, indulge me in some ugly history. So in the 90s, when people were first doing quantum cohomology stuff derived from physics, uh, they, they observed that the dimension of the moduli space of maps was frequently the wrong dimension. And they would fix this by deforming M itself to be almost complex. So they would leave algebraic geometry altogether and, uh, and then they would get something of the correct dimension and say, yeah, that's the sort of, then they'd say, yeah, it doesn't matter which almost complex deformation we use, we get the, um, <clears throat> uh, we get uh, the same computations uh, when we're done. And so what was cooked up later was the idea that if your space is too big, um, if it's got the wrong dimension, then maybe you should not try to integrate over your space of maps. You should define something that's, that takes this, that substitutes for the fundamental class of that space. And that's the, um, this uh, uh, virtual fundamental class. So, uh, so that was a way of escaping dealing with, the, um, with these, uh, these deformations. All right, so Jim Bryan is correcting my history. Um, as well he ought. Um, <clears throat> and, uh, but anyway, we don't have to do that anymore, but also we didn't have to do it before. Yeah, so what's the SNCD? It's right here. So the SNCD, uh, oh, in general, yeah. Um, so the SNCD though on this particular guy is the divisor of those curves where, so those maps of, uh, of sigma into M, where sigma has broken, it's broken into two pieces or, or more. So in general, you know, generically it's gonna break into two pieces and then there'll be the places lower dimension in the stratification or breaks into three pieces, four pieces. But the, uh, in general, the SNCD is <clears throat> um, that we're defining on this 
space of maps is the uh, the reducible ones. Okay, so um, uh, so now I'm going to be thinking about that. I'm going to think about maps to gmod to gmod p to by whatever my partial flag manifold is. So if you don't like general G, then think Grossmannian, um, or maybe even better, think flag manifold, full flags. But uh, if um, if you if you want to say stuff with the Grossmannian, that's already interesting enough here. So I'm going to I'm going to assume that my uh, that my sigma is glued together from a bunch of P1s glued in a chain. And that chain, so, uh, so I'm drawing these, uh, these P1s, uh, these are our P1s, I guess, that I'm drawing here, okay? Uh, so each of these P1s though, I'm going to, I'm gonna spin. I'm gonna rotate them uh, using this action of, let's say C cross, I said GM, but you can think the multiplicative group of C. I'm rotating each of these P1s and that leaves the points where they're intersecting uh, invariant. And it also leaves this sort of zero end of things and this infinity end of things invariant, okay? And, um, and then I'm gonna think about equivariant maps from that guy into G mod P. And so on G mod P, I need to tell you, I can't say equivariant until I say how I'm gonna act on G mod P, which um, I do here. I say fix a regular dominant. Um, uh, I should, and it should say co-weight, that's terrible. Um, <clears throat> because a, a weight is a map from your torus to C cross, a co-weight is a map from C cross to your torus. That's what I want, a regular dominant co-weight. So uh, what's nice about a regular dominant co-weight is that the Bionitsky Brule decompositions it defines on the flag manifold. So there's always two of them, flow towards zero or flow towards infinity. Those two decompositions, they are the B orbit closures or the B orbits versus the B minus orbits. Those are the two stratifications you get or decompositions you get from this circle action. And so uh, you can already sort of hear the Richardsons showing up when I say, let's think about um, a regular dominant co -weight. So here's what I got. I'm thinking about, about these equivariant maps. And, <clears throat> um, uh, and I define this space now where I've got M of these marked points and um, zero is kind of the simplest case to think about, but if you want to do resolution of singularities, you want to use um, at least one. One is certainly good enough to think about here. Um, it's going to be maps of, uh, of P1 into G mod P. Um, and I'm sorry, uh, let's take M equals zero for just a second. So I've just got two marked points. And those two marked points, you should think of as this zero and this infinity. So I demand that the zero ends up one place on my flag manifold and the infinity ends up on another place on my flag manifold. This U and V that were showing up when I was talking about um, Richardson's. So I have, here I have this Richardson, it's stuffed between U and V. And now I'm asking that my curve also somehow be between U and V. So if you don't impose the GM on here, if you just say I'm mapping to the flag manifold, then we know by Fulton Pandre Pande that we get a smooth orbifold. If you then say, well, yeah, but I also like this point to end up here and this other point to end up there, then those conditions are nice and generic and that's also smooth. And then you take the fixed points and that's also smooth. So that's where I'm getting this smooth variety. So, and, so, so why, why um, so you're only ever looking at the fixed point. So why do you consider this bigger space in which the fixed point, this non-contact, Bigger space, the local equivalent substack, uh, in which you are you actually considering that, or you just stick to the fixed points? Um, so, what's going to happen? Maybe this is not quite your question, but what's going to happen is 
Um, I'm going to be evaluate. I'm going to. There's a map on here to GMODP. This guy um, uh, that says wh where is the point one go, right? So zero is going to go here. Infinity is going to go there. And I'm asking where does one go? And um, and one is not one of these um, nodal points. So it's not going to a T fixed point, um, probably. So I ask where the one goes. And the answer is going to be it will land inside the Richardson from U to V. And so you might ask, in fact, that means, in fact, my entire curve is landing inside that Richardson. So why did I say let's consider maps to GMOD P if what I really want is maps to the Richardson? And it's because I want to use this to know that I'm getting something smooth. So um, okay, so it's I I think this is crazy, but this this was the cheapest proof for me that maps the entire flag manifold is smooth. Therefore, this thing I'm working on will be smooth by you know a couple of steps, um, and then oh what do you know it only hits the Richardson. So so it's not great. So the way in which it smooths, which I agree this way is is cheap, is not cheap in other ways. Right? It's not at least obviously smooth from some other point of view, from the Richardson. Well, for example, um, uh, I'm telling you that if you take any Richardson variety in the Grismanian and you make this thing, it'll be smooth. And I was curious, what if you take like a Positroid variety in the Grismanian? That seems like a, a, um, a small um, generalization of Richardson, and those are not smooth. I, uh, I worked on an example uh, of a Positroid variety where this variety, the thing you make here is not smooth. And when you resolve, we, and when you, like in some examples, when you see the singularities, they now have like uh, moduli meaning. Uh, so so you, you, your resolution now has geometric meaning, which is kind of, a, uh, a, 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 this canonical resolution has a geometric meaning. Yep, yep. And uh, I mean, that was true with Bob Samuelson as well, of course, right? That was there. Yeah, but this is- this It is, wasn't canonical, right? But, uh, but geometrically, I mean, I, it was a moduli problem. It was this tuples of flags. But a canonical resolution, which is a moduli problem, I, I feel like after the fact, I'd hope to say, oh yeah, of course we should have, that's just this, or like of course in retrospect, we should have defined this, but it's not, I presume. So there's one step I, uh, uh, I'm not sure I had on here, which is what is beta? So the, um, so where do you get a hold? It's probably on the next one or something. Uh, no. Uh, uh, so what is beta? Um, this is only for uh, a, a particular choice of beta. Take a point in your Richardson, so somewhere uh, above U and below V, and take the, so a, a general point, um, and take the orbit through that general point um, of, this, of this one parameter gr uh, group row check. And for almost all points, when you flow down towards zero, you'll make it down to U. And you flow up towards, uh, towards infinity, and you'll make it up to V. So that, then you take the closure, and that gets you a P1 inside your Richardson. And that P1 has the, has the homology class that I want. I'm taking, <clears throat> I'm taking that as my beta. Okay. So, so Alan, just the, the, the properness here, I'm just trying to think through the properness again for M less than or equal to one. You might worry though that um, your sort of dual graph of your stable thing, which you've required to be a linear tree might break into some sort of more complicated um, tree in moduli. So why, what is preventing that from happening? Right, so let, if, I, if I don't put on the GM action, okay, then, um, I mean, so with, so don't take the invariance yet, okay? So just to have everything else. And I will end up with this non-compact space. Now that non-compact space will, um, uh, it will have multiple, um, it will have multiple components. And, uh, and the sort of thing that would, that can happen there is that uh, 
one of your P1s can degenerate. Let's see. No, uh, this is not fair. Um, I can't get it by degeneration. That's the issue. So what you could have in your non-compact space is you could have a P1 with a trivial action glued to three P1s that are going to be things getting rotated. Okay? And so that P1 with a trivial action has three nodes sitting on it glued to these three P1s and they are rotating. And so those P1s that are rotating though, some of them are like moving forwards along the, the GM, some of them are moving backwards along the GM. So that particular P1 with the three nodes will be collapsing inside uh, under this map <clears throat> um, because uh, it must, because the fixed points for the GM action on the target are isolated. So that guy's collapsing. And, but then I would have like some P1s that are going forward, some P1s that are going backward, and I will get the wrong, um, uh, the wrong homology class. I won't get the beta that I wanted. I will get like uh, too much. Um, uh, so let me say it this way. Um, if you consider the moment map for on G mod P for the action of Rocheck, and you take one of these uh, these curves that we don't want to see, and you take its a uh, um, <clears throat> and you take you take its image under the moment map for Rocheck. Of course, it's going to be the entire interval, but the the Dasterman Heckman measure you'll get on that will not just be Lebesgue measure. It'll be Lebesgue measure times some multiple in some places. And I want it, the beta is thinking I want to get exactly just that measure once. So, okay, so, so you're, you know, roughly speaking, you're avoiding multiple classes of, of some of these curve classes here. Yes, yes. And so if I don't put on that GM, my point is that this thing will not be proper. Um, if you then take the, uh, the GM fixed points though, that will be proper. Okay. So another way to think about it is what's going to happen. So I've got one of these guys mapping in, like maybe it's just a single P1, but mapping in uh, to my G mod P. And I wonder how can this thing degenerate? And the answer is uh, one of these guys can develop a node somewhere along the way, but it was spinning. And once it develops that node, it's going to be in the middle. And, and it's just going to keep these guys spinning like that. So. That's that's what's involved in getting only these uh, these weights that wherever these two guys are connected, they're spinning the same way. Is that uh, is that pseudo convincing enough to go on? Yep, sure. All right. So here's the main theorems. I think I already hinted about some of them. Um, uh, I've got one of these, one of these curves, one of these uh, chains of uh, of CP ones, sequence, you know, this the sequence of CP ones, and I, it's a, and I look where the fixed points on it went. So of course, zero went to U, infinity went to V, and the things along the way go to a chain in um, Bruja order. So uh, associated to this guy sigma, I get a chain in this open Bruja interval. So this open interval, what that means is all of the vial group elements strictly between U and V. <clears throat> uh, then if you fix um, uh, the ones that, that are going to go through those, you get a product of smaller such things. And so that's how I check that this guy is an SNCD. OK. Um, and it's a. Um, anti-canonical for G mod B. So, um, sorry, I missed. Why uh, was it anti uh, Okay, uh, how did you know it was anti-canonical? So here's how I would like to find out that something is anti-canonical. Um, I would much prefer. So anti-canonical means it arises by taking a section of the anti-canonical bundle. And what's much better than being anti-canonical is being equivariantly anti-canonical that it arises from an invariant section of the anti-canonical bundle. 
And so, uh, so let me give you a non-example of that. Let's take a C cross acting on CP1. And we know the anti-canonical um, class is O of two. And so there's three torus invariant effective uh, um, divisors there. I could have the South Pole twice, or the South Pole and the North Pole, or the North Pole twice. But only the one plus one guy, South Union North, that's the only one that's uh, that's given by a C cross invariant section of the anti canonical bundle. So not X squared, not Y squared, but XY. And that's the, so the statement is better than this thing is anti canonical. It's that it's equivariantly anti canonical. Now, uh, the way you check that is you check that it's doing the right thing at my isolated fixed points. So I, I figure out isolated fixed point by point uh, that it's defining the correct class. Okay. Excellent, thanks. So what's the dual complex? It's, the, it's called the order complex of this Bruja interval. So it's got a vertex for every element of the open interval, not for u, not for v, only the things in between. Because um, <clears throat> when I had one here, so I've got zero goes to u, infinity goes to v, uh, and one goes somewhere in between, um, I don't have one going to u or to v. So I get this, I get this open interval. And uh, the order complex is what's called the sorry, sorry, the as in the dual complex is what's called the order complex of this post set. So the way you make an order complex of a post set is you <clears throat> have a vertex for every um, element of the post set and a simplex for every chain in the post set. And that's what I got. Here's the here's my chains. So I'm uh, so a chain for me gives me a smaller stratum in my SNCD, which gives me therefore dually a larger face in my dual complex. And again, the combinatorialists got there first. This is homeomorphic to a sphere. So, um, yep, 40 years ago. Um, and this was uh, what, uh, I already talked about with Ravi that I'm um, using Gmod B to uh, to get a hold of this thing. Should I be sad that the uh, re the where where you're getting the sphere from is like a purely combinatorial thing and uh, not from some geometric uh, like the I, I most want from the folklore conjecture some geometric reason to see why there's a sphere, but I have no idea what that would look like, so I'm not actually sad yet. Um, no, I, I think you can be sad. Go go ahead. Uh, okay. Uh, yeah, I mean, what they do in Kolar Shu is uh, prove this homology uh, sphere statement, and um, uh, and yeah, um, I mean, um, so yeah. Um, uh, so, so here's, uh, I'll tell you how, um, how combinatorialists care about, or how, how combinatorialists prove this homeomorphic to balls and spheres thing. So the, um, uh, there the, the theorem is if the, <clears throat> um, if the, Simplicial complex is shellable. So if there's this way of gluing on the balls one by one, and and it could happen when you glue on your very last ball that the intersection of them is not a ball of codimension one, but is in fact the entire boundary sphere of each of them. And then you get a sphere. So the theorem is if your simplicial complex is shellable and it is thin, which is the statement that any codimension one face is only contained in one or two co-dimension zero faces. So like this guy with uh, three edges connected at a vertex, that's not thin because uh, this guy has an inside and an outside and a something, right? So what you want is uh, like exterior ridges 
should have an inside but not an outside. Interior ridges have both an inside and an outside. So that thinness condition, uh, if you're shellable and thin, then you're homeomorphic to a ball or sphere. So uh, that's how we proved uh, that. That's um, that's uh, um, a not exactly how Buerner and Wax prove the um, the um, the ball the sphereness of what they're doing um, because as I said it's hard to come up with shellings so they um, uh, they put a bunch of extra structure on the on the Bruja order and uh, which then leads them to um, to find a particularly uh, tricky shelling and they call the the Bruja order EL shellable for, I figure out the E is, L is lexicographic. Um, uh, anyway, it's a, um, it's tricky. So here's an example. Um, uh, again, it's the flag manifold in C3 that I'm blowing up with, uh, <clears throat> with my moduli space of maps. And, uh, and here's the simple complex. So what are one of these things? So a vertex is when you um, um, how do these go? So well, I'm forgetting right now. Um, I've looked at this slide in a while. So I'm going to jump ahead though and say, because uh, how are we doing? Uh, yeah, so this is, uh, I should certainly end at this point. So the, uh, the very last thing is to say that um, the, the reason that my moduli space of maps had isolated fixed points and was therefore easy to think about was that my moduli space of curves was in a space that's GKM. So GKM manifold is better than isolated fixed points. It's got isolated fixed curves. And when you study the space of maps into this guy with isolated fixed curves, that has isolated fixed points. But Grismanians are better. They have isolated fixed points, isolated fixed curves, and isolated fixed surfaces. So when you think about P1's mapping into the Grismanian, that will have isolated fixed curves. It'll be GKM. And there's this way to draw GKM spaces with um, uh, where you where you draw the points and the curves, and so I computed that guy for the um, for the Grismanian, and I should stop there. Great. So now.